Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm very honored to be asked to do this talk. I'm going to focus on why don't cochlear implants work better and, and what we can do perhaps to make them better, highlighting the work from my lab in the Sense Lab at Cambridge. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the many people in the lab who've made a lot of this work possible and the funders that we've had. Um, everybody in this conference knows that cochlear implants are not perfect. Uh, there's an awful lot of variability in outcomes. Uh, the number of publications have been shooting up over the last few years on cochlear implants. And yet, the performance has been quite plateaued over the last few years. Uh, we also know that cochlear implant users don't have many information channels. If you turn on more and more electrodes, you don't get better and better performance. And this is particularly uh, true uh, in quiet. Um, and uh, I think this is, these are all things I don't have to spend time on because people on this conference already know this. A large part of the problem is this electro-neural interface. This is a micro uh, CT, synchrotron CT, uh, done by our colleagues, uh, Sumit Agarwal and, and uh, Rask Anderson. And this is a medal cochlear implant. This is the reconstruction of the spiral ganglion uh, along the Rosenthal's canal. And this is gap here between the implant and the spiral ganglion, which we're trying to stimulate. And this is sitting this implant in the conductive medium, the perilymph, which has got a lot of conductive uh, uh, perilymph in it, which can actually conduct electricity and spread current. Uh, there's also the problem that some of these cochleas have sick regions where there's no spiral ganglion cells, of course. That's why they're implanted, because they're not healthy. And this can result in the, this particular electrode, for instance, not being able to stimulate anything here until they turn the current up enough that it stimulates an adjacent uh, part of the spiral ganglion, which is also being stimulated by another electrode, so you get current confusion as well. So lots of problems with the machine uh, uh, neural interface and cochlear implants, and the current spread means that it's practically impossible to focus stimulation with current stimulation strategies. There's dead regions inside the modiolus, so you lose some frequencies. Uh, um, in terms of being able to present them to the right part of the cochlea, and there's some channel confusion. There's trauma from the insertion, which causes damage, delayed fibrosis, inflammation, loss of residual hearing. There's a foreign body reaction from having a big piece of, pla a big piece of plastic stuck in the cochlea. There's poor electrical dynamic range because cochlea goes from having uh, no response to all of a sudden a maximum firing and a fairly short dynamic electrical range. The apex, as we saw, is all clumped together. It's difficult to disentangle the low frequencies in that apical uh, neural clump uh, area. Uh, and the cochlear shape variations means that one size electro does not fit every cochlea, and there's a lot of variations. So we want to talk about how can we use models to understand what's going on, in, uh, essentially build digital physical twins of the cochlea to probe in more detail uh, what's going on in that electroneural interface, and how can we use them to help us develop uh, better electrodes. So the models we use are cadaveric and physical models. So we have over 85 micro CT scans of human cochlea. We've developed segmentation algorithms that let us really help uh, get to them segmented very quickly now into the exact anatomy of that cochlea. We can even uh, find land anatomical landmarks that place the trajectories of the nerves within that cochlea so we have them anatomically accurate. Uh, within this, uh, this uh, work grouping, we also have cadaveric recordings where we actually put wires into the cochlea and the uh, regions where we think the spiral ganglion neurons would sit in the modiolus and the, and the basal turn here. Uh, and uh, Chloe in our labs done a lot of this work uh, and we actually put implants in the stimulant and see what voltages are, are uh, received in these regions here. Uh, we've also made 3D printed cochleas, which we take from the uh, uh, micro CT scans and try and make uh, physical twins of the cadaver exactly uh, anatomically accurate. And, and within these, we put pores to tune them electrically so they look like the um, the uh, uh, like the like the cadaveric bone electrically by by putting saline in these pores. We put more pores in the modulus than in the um, than in, in the cortex because it's what this is what's uh, true electrically inside the cadaveric temporal bone. And this is just a quick uh, uh, slice through showing the, the size of the pores as we go from one side to the other. We can tune them so they give us the same EFI electrical field imaging as a cadaver they came from. 
um, and we've actually um, done a lot of complex impedance measurements on these three printed implants to show they're the same kind of electrical activities uh, as a caliber they came from. Uh, we've also made 3D printed cochleas uh, based on these calibric uh, uh, cochleas where we've 3D um, taken the micro CT scans exactly reproduce them with 3D printing uh, uh, fairly accurately uh, and then put wires into the uh, every two millimeters into these uh, uh, structures and then put primordial and lateral electrodes into them to see what voltages are generated in the sites where we'd expect spiral ganglion cells to be. Uh, when you compare the electrical fields that we get with monopolar stimulation, um, tripolar, partial tripolar of various kinds um, stimulation within the cadaver that we measured the voltages in the modial places, different recording wires, and where we put measure them in the 3D printed wires, and these are these are different uh, um, this is one cochlea, sorry. Uh, we get relatively similar responses in the 3D prints as we do in the cadavers. Um, these are for uh, different modes, these are for tripolar modes, these are for partial tripolar modes, these are for bipolar modes. We've done this uh, for about six cochleas. Uh, we've also done computational models, end-to-end -end computational models, where we take that anatomy and then we actually make final Elmer models of it, calculate the electrical fields from an implant inside that structure, and then we <coughs> and then we use the um, characterization of, of the of the nerves to figure out the activation function uh, that we might expect uh, across these nerves and try and calculate uh, the firing that might happen within that structure. So in this, we've taken the um, corpus of material from a sentences, trained, uh, uh, done the spectrogram and uh, done the uh, electrodogram, put into a 3D printed, uh, sorry, 3D computational models, look at the fields that we generate inside the skull of timpani, then put them into a phenomenological model where we generate the firing rate. We train an ASR, AI, uh, ASR on this output to see how that would relate. Uh, to percentage information transmission across here by how many of these sentences it would understand. Generally a confusion matrix from the model uh, and then comparing it to what was done uh, or was discovered in human listeners from the same corpus and they're not that far off. We've also gone a little bit further with the computational models uh, where we've taken the exact uh, computational model uh, from a cadaver uh, and this is the original cadaver and this is the the voltage that were measured uh, by the uh, by the cadaver uh, in the wires that we measured in these places and this is the simulations that we have uh, of the uh, voltage we would predict based on the computational model in this model we spent a lot of time on this um, uh, on this uh, modiolus and the and the uh, fine structure of the, of the um, uh, porous structure of this so that this really causes a lot of drop of uh, and modulation of the electrical fields around here so that we can start to understand what the electrical fields are on the other side of that when they're transformed by this very complex porous structure. And these are for two specimens. We can see we get pretty good replications of the original uh, specimen uh, from our model and the electrical fields that we generate inside there, inside the scala timpani, are similar to what we actually measured in the models themselves. Uh, we've also done in vitro model of cells where we actually uh, patch clamp uh, spiral ganglion cells and rats and we stimulate them with different um, current types of current sources to see how they respond. So with all these models in our, in our pocket, how can we use and improve um, specificity of stimulation and improve speech comprehension? For instance, can we uh, do something about changing electro design? Can we uh, do something by changing the stimulation mode? Can we do something by changing stimulation uh, electrode position within the cochlea? So how about electrode size? I mean, we could just put more and more electrodes in there, make them smaller and smaller. Uh, and that's certainly one thing that people have focused on in, in the past. Uh, this is a relatively simple computational model. Um, and this has all been published, by the way, most of this stuff. Um, the when we make the electrodes smaller and smaller, of course the impedance goes up, but the electrical fields that are generated within the skull of tympani are very similar, all the way from 0.05 to 0 0.2 millimeter electrodes. The electrical fields are exactly the same because the electrical field is dominated by the perilymph and not by the size of the electrodes. So having um, 
more small electrodes won't necessarily give you uh, small more focused um, fields measured in the parallel uh, if they're still the same distance away from from the from the um, uh, spiral modiolus uh, uh, sorry from the modiolus and spiral ganglion cells How about different stimulation modes? Uh, currently, uh, we find that uh, most electrodes use monopolar stimulation, so you inject the current, maybe electrode 8, uh, and you have, have it sucked out in a ground electrode, which is usually outside the cochlea, uh, usually on the casing or the ring electrode, and that's an active uh, uh, ground, which is the opposite configuration of the injected current. If this is cathodic or nodic, this, this would be nodic cathodic. But we can also uh, do uh, bipolar, where we inject the current uh, h here and we, we suck it up one or two or three electrons away. We can also do tripolar, where we inject the current uh, here and suck out half on each side, so that's very focused. And we can do versions which use combinations, so uh, some is tripolar, and a lot of it sucked out ex extra cochlearly in the monopolar, so some combination of those. In the fairly simple linear model I described before, we've also measured the voltage you might uh, experience uh, in this place where the spiral ganglion cells would be uh, for monopolar, bipolar, and tripolar electrodes to so stimulate this particular electrode. We see a quite broad distribution of electric fields from monopolar, quite a high voltage though. Bipolar and tripolar are much less uh, voltage generated. This is partial tripolar. Uh, perhaps the tripolar is more focused when you normalize it, but the voltages are very small. You'd have to use a lot of current to, to generate enough depolarization uh, to stimulate spiral ganglion cells there. Uh, in uh, our cadaveric recordings, we've done spent a lot of time uh, making this porous structure around the modial is more accurate because a lot of voltage drop across there. And then we can compare recordings uh, from the cadavers with the exact same models that we've built Porting into our computational models, and we can look at the uh, the model versus the simulated uh, uh, voltages that we might expect at the places where the wires were measured for monopolar, uh, partial tripolar, fifty percent going extra extra cochlear, seventy five uh, percent uh, tripolar, true tripolar. Uh, we get fairly good um, um, uh, accordances between our models and between what we find with the measurements. Uh, basically, the monopolar gives you much higher uh, voltages than the bipolar and tripolar, both of them measured in the cadavers, uh, truly measured in the cadavers, not in a simple model, and also in a computational model as well. How about by changing the position of the electrode? So you can have lateral wall electrodes sitting next to a striovascularis. This is a basal membrane, also spirolaminous, scarlet tympani. Or you can sit right next to the spiral ganglion, next to the modiolus. Or you can sit in between in the mid scala. This is the AB device in the mid scala. Uh, this is the more cochlear device, Primodiola. All three companies make lateral wall electrodes. We've investigated this in our 3D printed models. Uh, these are uh, results from our 3D printed models looking at the uh, um, manufacturer one, which it makes it mid scala electrode, uh, and comparing that to lateral wall electrode. And these are the monopolar responses uh, from the mid scala, which is solid, uh, versus the uh, lateral wall, which is dashed, uh, for 
monopolar for uh, uh, partial tripolar modes and for tri tripolar and bipolar modes. Uh, and essentially for monopolar, not much difference at all. Uh, when we do a dB version, this is the, the actual voltage, this is a uh, dB scale of these, uh, we find um, uh, that perhaps for the tripolar there's some difference, uh, but for the monopolar very little difference. Um, this particular top model is, um, this is when you stimulate one electrode and what's measured from all the wires in that model from base to apex. This this group of uh, recordings, a little bit the opposite. This is when you take what's seen at one recording wire when you stimulate all the electrodes. Uh, but they're different versions of the same thing and they both show the same thing. That monopolar um, stimulation uh, gives very little difference in lateral and, and uh, mid-scala. Uh, and there's perhaps a little bit of difference at the tripolar regions. This is the difference between mid scale and lateral wall in the voltage in six different six different cadavers that we that we made this for. Um, and perhaps there's a slight bump up in tripolar. Uh, this is tripolar plus uh, zero, which means that the adjacent electrodes are the ones sucking electrode uh, su sucking current out. This is tripolar plus two, where the current sucked at two down uh, either side. There's perhaps a little bit of uh, increased uh, voltage when you use, uh, when you use the peri uh, 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 mid scala versus the lateral wall in some of these cochlears, but many not so. This is uh, looking at the other manufacturer it makes a bit more of a true perimodial electrode. Um, again, monopolar uh, perimodial versus lateral wall, slight difference, but not a huge amount. Um, and when we look at bipolar, so this particular manufacturer can't do tripolar. Uh, we find that the uh, perimodular does have a little bit more uh, voltage than the lateral wall for, for both bipolar um, plus three, which is the, the, the electrodes, with the current current three electrodes down from the injecting current and bipolar plus uh, plus zero, true bipolar, which is electrodes are next to each other. So these ones, which are lateral wall, have lower voltage than the perimodular ones. And in these ones, we see very little difference again in, in the monopolar, but if you look at the bipolar modes, um, you see that for these six cochleas, for at least three of them, um, and two of them quite strongly, there's a bit more uh, voltage generated for the uh, perimodial than for the lateral electrode. This is perimodial versus lateral is zero would mean no difference. So most of them show some effect, but it's very variable by cochlea. And in some, it does show a significant effect for the truly focused electrodes, but not so much for the, for the uh, monopolar electrodes. Interestingly, when you look at it by distance uh, from the recording wire, uh, we, when we compare the lateral wall, which is a blue, and red is the perimodial electrodes. For bipolar electrodes, uh, for manufacturer two, it makes a true perimodial electrode. The distance from the recording wire to the electrode that's stimulating uh, makes a difference for bipolar stimulation for the perimodial electrodes, uh, but it doesn't so much for lateral wall electrodes because they're all quite far. Um, whereas for monopolar, it makes very little difference. Even the ones that are closer seem to have the same voltage as ones that are further. Uh, for the other manufacturer, which only makes lateral wall electrodes, this is only testing for monopolar. Again, the distance doesn't seem to make a difference. So this is telling us that for monopolar stimulation, the distance to the recording wire makes very little difference. Whereas if you're going to use bipolar stimulation, then getting closer to that recording wire with the spiral ganglion cells, it does give you some advantage. So we've also done this uh, computationally. Uh, we've looked at the electrical fields here, uh, electrical fields on this side, in different uh, uh, for different electrodes from apical to mid to mid to basal, uh, and on here is the uh, is the activating function. We think the firing that would be caused by cells uh, in, in Rosenthal's canal. So the apex, a fairly tight electrical field generated. Uh, and this is the firing we'd expect. This is for lateral wall versus perimodial for the same electrode. Uh, and we can compare, uh, as we get uh, more and more basal, we tend to get bigger electrical fields, but we tend to get very little difference between lateral wall uh, and perimodial in terms of the activation here of these electrodes in this model. Uh, but as we go more and more basal, we start to see more uh, activation of the peripheral processes here. And perhaps there is some difference, perhaps it's slightly more uh, activation of the proof of primordial than with the lateral wall electrodes. 
uh, which is what we see a slight increase in the activation of these perimodial electrodes, um, sorry, of these, of these peripheral processes uh, which are running along the osseospiral ganglion uh, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, perimodial and the lateral electrodes. When we look at tripolar stimulation in this model, uh, we see much more tightly focused fields, these are uh, in apical and basal electrodes, much more tightly focused fields, both the lateral and perimodiola. Uh, and here we do see for the perimodiola compared to lateral, uh, uh, more, the, even though very few, uh, very few uh, spiral ganglion cells are activated because the voltage are quite low, um, there is a difference in that the perimodiola does stimulate more cells than the lateral wall, and the difference is, is uh, in both the fields, uh, and the activation uh, is plotted here. You can see that there's both peripherally and centrally a uh, bit more activation in the la in the primordial than the lateral wall um, electrodes for tripolar stimulation. I mentioned earlier that we'd made um, these models where we'd done an end-to-end -end computational model. We've taken a corpus of of uh, uh, material, speech material, extracted the envelopes, etc and done an electrodogram, put it into a 3D um, uh, model, finite ELMO model, general neural uh, firing patterns. And along this, we can port any part of this system out to the ASR, the, the, the um, AI recognition engine, to see how what percentage of these sentences can be understood from this part, uh, from this part, or from this part, or after neurogram. And this tells us where the information drop might be. Uh, and with this end-to-end -end model, we can play games like taking out uh, uh, dead regions, putting some neural dead regions in, in the modules and switching off the electrodes there and things like that, seeing how, what, how that might change um, our speech understanding. And when we do that, actually, when we, when we put dead regions into the, into the model uh, and we put narrow dead regions or wide dead regions, and then we switch off the electrodes over them uh, and, and reassign the frequencies and see if that makes much difference. In our model, it doesn't make much difference. We perhaps have a 5% change um, and uh, this is not un this is not dissimilar to what perhaps clinically people have found too. Uh, we've also been played with the spiral ganglion cells, a lot of heterogeneity in the responses. We've patched about 90 of them now, uh, and we can see that some of them have um, different, uh, some have unitary ducting functions, some of them fire throughout the pulse spike, some fire just from the onset, and some fire and fatigue quickly, some don't. Um, so there's a lot of variability, and I think our models don't reflect that very well yet. We're putting a very uh, homogenous type of spiral ganglion. This is a model made by Sarantos, who was a DTU PhD student, who came to my lab for, uh, for a few months. And based on recording of spiral ganglion cells, he, he uh, modeled how these cells will respond if they stimulate one at a time, whereas if they stimulate uh, previously, so that they, they were conditioned by prior stimulation of electrodes, which happens in real life. Look at the differences between the activation patterns you would see one at a time versus what you might see if it was stimulated previously by other electrodes. We need to include this also into our um, into our uh, model, and this is something I think that's currently missing in most models. <clears throat> so, how about models that might help us with troubleshooting? How can we understand what's going on clinically using models? So one of the things we've been working on is can you tell if electrodes are out of the cochlea? Because we found in our own series about 12% were out of the cochlea when we did x-rays about two weeks later. So if, the, if they're out and they're sitting in there, it's easy because the impedance would go up in those electrodes. Most of the time they're sitting in scar tissue or in blood. And in some cataract work we did, we found that uh, uh, when you, when you uh, put uh, three electrodes out, for instance, even though the impedance was normal in those electrodes, the, the electrical field, which is what's generated when you stimulate one electrode, the, the voltage stimulating all the other electrodes by the, by the current uh, spread along the cochlea, that collapses in those electrodes that are out. So here's three electrodes that you can see those are out. We can simulate this in our model as well. It found similar things, uh, and we get very similar simulations to what we find in cadaveric, um, cadaveric uh, experiments. In cadavers, we did this experiment and we're using all three types of devices, both um, A, B, cochlea, and medal. We found that uh, if they're sitting in uh, if they're sitting in air, of course, we're increasing pin, so that's easy. But when they're sitting in saline, 
um, then we couldn't tell from the impedances alone if the electrodes were out. But we got this collapse in the in the electrode the EFI in all three uh, manufacturers. We could tell how many electrodes out by how many electrodes showed this collapse. So cl so clinically, we've used this now quite often. Uh, for instance, here's a case I was operating on, uh, and uh, we at the end of surgery, uh, the impedances look good, but to me the EFIs or TIMS look like this. Um, uh, these three electrodes are out because there's a collapse and sure enough reopen the uh, the the surgical field find that three electrodes out uh, push them back in now we have a normal uh, EFI so we've used this many times now to actually detect electrodes out of the coat. Uh, we've also grown fibroblasts uh, on, on cochlear implants in, in a bioreactor to look at the effects over time of when fibrogen builds up on electrodes can we measure that using the uh, um, cochlear implant electrical responses of the electrodes. Uh, we've also used uh, th this uh, this information from the bioreactor to tell us if uh, if the uh, impedance changes could be suggestive of uh, uh, of um, fibrosis. We can see over fourteen days, as more and more fibrosis builds up, we get the change in the impedance, and it seems to be mostly resistive. So we're looking for signatures of fibrosis here, and these models can help us model them and see what we should be looking for. In our clinic, we often also struggle with uh, facial nerve stimulation, and this in this uh, cataract model, we put electrodes all along the facial nerve trajectory, measure the electrical fields, we put an implant inside the cochlea, and we, we calculate the activating function across here um, by using electrical fields that we measured, and also what we predict in the acoustic nerve, Long and short, we, we, we predicted that cathodic stimulation would be more likely to cause stimulation of the facial nerve than anodic stimulation. And this has been borne out by later experiments actually in our uh, in humans as well. Uh, we've also worked on detecting partial shorts in, uh, in our clinical practice. We've run into some partial shorts from one of the companies where they've had a manufacturing fault. And we find this, uh, what happens is that some of the wires uh, especially the, ba uh, the basal end short to the uh, ground wire, and when you when you uh, when you stimulate uh, these electrodes, they're not putting out much current. So uh, we can measure this on the head by putting by measuring the artifact uh, from stimulation. Uh, when we stimulate each electrode, we find this drop in the in these voltages that we measure on the head when we stimulate those electrodes. And we've made a whole head model now, which includes a pathway from the cochlea to the scalp, the impedance pathway. And we can simulate this, and we can see in the sorry in the simulation here, we predict similar kinds of things to what we what we find. So we can try and use measurements on the surface of the scalp to try and detect what's going on inside the cochlea as well. As well. So in summary, what we're trying to do is build models that are versatile, can act as platforms, understanding findings in humans, understand the physical and pathological basis. We want to use this to develop existing treatment strategies and develop new ones. I want to understand the effect of variability in size and morphology of the cochlea on stimulation signal propagation inside the inner ear uh, and the nerve. And essentially, we'd like to be able to model individual cochleas if we could figure out how much uh, residual um, spiral ganglia cell uh, functions left. We could actually try and build personalized models of stimulation for each individual patient. So the future, I, was, I think, it, it's not going to be easy to improve conform, performance of current CI technologies. We cannot really focus electrical stimulation very easily, uh, not using monopolar stimulation. And, um, and we may be able to get a little bit better with tri uh, tripolar or uh, stimulation if we can get close enough to the uh, spiral ganglion cells. Um, so I think we're in interim phase right now. We haven't got better technologies. We're trying to do the best we can with the technologies we have. I, I suspect we need biological therapies to decrease the electroneuron gap, perhaps by causing spiral ganglion cells to grow out to the implant. We might need other kinds of stimulation as optogenetic. We might need other sites of stimulation where we don't have a large chunk of perilymph between us and the, and the nerve, such as in the artery nerve itself, in the modiolus or some other place. Um, so one of the play things we're looking at is uh, doing using what we have. Can we change the pulse shape? So we've looked at um, stimulating rectangular exponential and ramp pulses and um, shown that there's some differences in how the cells respond at the single cell level when we patch clamp them. 
So there might be one uh, way forward. We can also try and make uh, the spiroganglion cells grow out to the implant so they get better contact, more selectivity. Here we've uh, transfected them with a gene uh, which causes growth and we show the much greater outgrowth of the neurites uh, to uh, compare to the control. We didn't transfect them. Uh, so this is another very early at this stage strategy we could think about to try and get the spiroganglion cells to grow closer to the implant itself. We can also think about biohybrid implants where we could grow, for instance, uh, neurons or non-specific stem cell drive neurons that grow on the, on the uh, electrodes and go out and touch the spiroganglion cells, make synapses with them. And one of the PhD students in my lab spent a lot of time showing how these stem cells were, were conditioned by the astrocytes we were grown with. Their firing rates were very determined by the astrocytes we were grown with, so we've, we're trying to figure out which astrocytes to grow them with. He was also able to show that when you grew these stem cells on this side of a, of a microelectro array, uh, they grew axons to spiral ganglion cells that we grew on the other side, and they could stimulate them. When we stimulate these electrodes, um, they cause these cells to fire, and they synapsed with these cells uh, at glutamineergically and uh, cause the spiral ganglion cells to fire. And he's just uh, uh, showing that uh, under high power, we can see the synaptic labeling. And this just shows that when we stimulate the um, uh, the these uh, uh, stem cells on this side that causes firing of spiroganglion cells, but if you block them with a glutamate receptor, it, it stops the firing increase. So they they are causing it via a glutaminergic synaptic connection, not by direct electrical stimulation. Going, uh, you, some of you might have seen some of the press we got about gene therapy, and uh, I was very lucky to be involved with this and forming one of the first gene therapies in the world. Uh, for otoferlin, and this might be something coming down the pipeline for some kinds of autoneuropathies um, that might be limiting um, this cochlear implant function. So this is uh, essentially the story uh, from our lab so far. Lots of work to do. We're, we feel like we're just scratching the surface here, and I thank you all very much for your attention.